Welcome back to our series on transformational leadership. Uh, in our two previous uh, sessions, uh, we learned that uh, for transformational leadership to take place, uh, first of all, leaders must lead with passion. We've got to be committed to the cause for which we're giving ourselves and, and giving our leadership. But passion by itself is not enough. In addition to being passionate, we need to be competent. We need to know what we're doing and do it with the very best of our ability. Uh, as we try to understand more about what it means to, to lead with uh, competence or lead with excellence, there are several books that I have used in our research uh, to help us to understand what some of the latest ideas are from international communities and research uh, so that we might be the best leaders possible. One is the book Canoeing the Mountains by Todd Bolsinger, who's a professor at Foley University. A wonderful story in there about how we need to be willing to make changes when things, change, when things are different. Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, is, is a classic example of, of what it means to share a vision uh, for, uh, for, for leadership and to involve your organization or, or your congregation to come along with you. And then the Kuzis and Posner series on the leadership challenge. They've spent uh, thousands of dollars and done research in countries around the world, in different kinds of cultures, in both uh, business for profit and nonprofit organizations to see what is it that helps these organizations to go beyond uh, many of their peers and even some of their competitors. So these are researches uh, that we will be use, using to find out how we can lead uh, with excellence. What, what is leadership? Uh, Todd Bolsinger, in, in his book, um, the Canoeing the Mountain, said, leadership is energizing a community of people toward their own transformation in order to accomplish a shared mission in the face of a changing world. That's what we want to do. Our world is changing. The pandemic, uh, the social unrest, uh, the, the increased violence and religious persecution around the world has called us to raise up the very best among us to be those transformational leaders. How can we not only be energized ourselves for, for this calling or this challenge, but how can we uh, uh, affiliate around us uh, those leaders who will join with us in the cause for justice? There are five exemplary leadership models. If we are going to be uh, successful leaders, then the first practice is model the way. Uh, the second is inspire a shared vision. The third is to challenge the process. The fourth is to enable others to act. And the fifth is encourage the heart. Uh, between this session today and, and the next one, uh, we will cover all five of these best practices so that we might be as competent and, and uh, uh, successful as possible in our pursuit of justice. Even before we begin to lead, we need to take a close look at what the realities are. Uh, this would call for assessment. How do we assess a situation to see what changes are needed and what opportunities are even available? Uh, Todd Boltzinger, in his book, talks about the three different uh, uh, parts of assessment. Uh, one is observing or observation. The second one is interpreting or interpretation. And the third one is implementing or implementation. If, if a CEO from an organization uh, begins new in a new work or new environment, uh, the first thing he must do is to realize that observation is essential. How can we go in and lead an organization when we know very little about the organization? Um, what, how does the organization embrace change? Uh, before implementing a strategy, it, it's, it, maybe it's a strategy that worked in another situation, but, but may not be appropriate for the, the new organization or the new situation. How can we determine um, what is the history of this organization? Perhaps it's a church, or, or maybe it's even a public institution. What is its history? What is its DNA? What makes it unique from any other organization? Who are its heroes? Study the stories about the organization and find out uh, who were the ones who were successful in the past, and why did they esteem them to be so successful? Uh, what are their celebrations? What are the things that really brings them joy and, and causes them to celebrate? The, the non-negotiable values. Why should we waste our time on trying to change values that are not going to be changed? I mean, these are intrinsic to the organization's health and personality. What is the reputation and what are the dreams 
of these organizations. Uh, the Boltzinger talks about in his book uh, a surprise finding that the Lewis and Clark expedition learned uh, after they had been deployed. Uh, President Thomas Jefferson, uh, at, right after the purchase of, of what now is the whole western part of the continent, the Louisiana Purchase, um, they, sent, they formed a, an expedition led by Lewis and Clark so that they could go and explore these new lands and, and see how they can be navigated. Well, the assumption was that once they get to the Missouri River, uh, right at the beginning of this new territory, uh, that there would be a waterway that would lead them all the way to the Pacific. And so they got the people who were the best navigators, the, the people uh, who, uh, they, who built the best canoes and boats, and they assembled them together, and then they made that long, arduous trek uh, to the Missouri River. Uh, as hard as it was, I mean, the winters and the disease and, and the attacks from enemies uh, constantly kept them in danger. Uh, fatigue was always just around the corner, but they kept pressing ahead, thinking, once we get to the Missouri River, we'll just put our canoes in the water and we will float our way across this new continent. Well, when they got to the Missouri River, were they ever surprised? thinking that they would see a waterway. Instead, they saw the Rocky Mountains. They had never seen a mountain range that was as tall or as wide or as broad as the Rocky Mountains. Uh, they thought they needed the best canoes to get from the Missouri River to the Pacific. What good would canoes do them in climbing mountains and trying to bridge all of those difficult and almost impossible uh, terrain. Well, sometimes our surprises call for a, a different paradigm. And so that's why we need to learn how to do observations. What, what are observations? Uh, observations, uh, when, when Boltzing was asking his church, he was a pastor of a church, uh, what is it that they're observing about their church? He said, when were you most excited or felt the deepest sense of connection to our church? Then he asked him a second question, what's changed your life? Or what's changed the life of the church since then that, that may have affected your sense of connection or excitement about our church? A third question when he was trying to understand observations was, what is the one wish, the one hope, the one dream that you have for the future of our church? If you're ready to lead an organization or an institution, these are very important questions to ask. In light of the pandemic that's, that's been worldwide, global, what are the things that have changed? What are the things that will never go back to the way they were? Uh, what are the lessons that we have learned and that we are learning because of this pandemic? Uh, if you're leading a government in a government position, you know, what are the things in your government work that pro have proven to be effective, uh, reliable, and, and help the, the most of, of the people? Uh, in an institution, what has made your institution profitable and successful? Or what are those things that no longer are able to accomplish that. The very first principle of assessment is observation. The second principle is interpretation. Many times we want to jump to interpretation too quickly. We'll start observing and then we want to know what does this mean? But, but it's more than that. It's more than just what does it mean? How do we take the data that we've gathered when we're observing and how do we understand this data? How do we interpret what this is telling to us? Uh, again, we, we see all of the consequences of the pandemic, or we see the consequences of religious persecution. Well, what does that lead to? Does that lead to more stability? Does that need, lead to economic growth? Or is it the very opposite? Uh, does it bring about a spirit of goodwill among your people? Or is it a spirit of suspicion and, and, and doubt and hopelessness? We need to take the data that we get from observations, and then we need to begin to interpret them in such a way that we understand what the implications are for the future. And when we've done observations and interpretations, uh, then we need to do implementations. 
okay, what are the changes that need to be made? What are the steps or the new direction that we need to take so that we don't repeat the failed practices of yesterday and so that we will be able to embrace the new challenges with, with new enthusiasm and, and new ideas and fresh energy? In implementation, the eventual solution will be a healthy adaptation of what the DNA is, whether it's of the church or or the organization or institution. Interventions need to start out modestly. You don't want to go in and throw everything away and start all over from scratch. How do you begin where people are and take these rich experiences of the past and begin to implement them in such a way that they're new and, and that they're exciting? Now, innovation will always be resisted. Not by everyone, but there will always be some, like when Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls of the city of Jerusalem that we uh, discussed earlier, uh, he had Sanballat and Tobiah and Gershom. Every step of the way when Nehemiah said, let's rebuild, let's come together, let's fix the walls, these three guys said, there's no way. Uh, well, you don't have the ability, you don't have the funding, you don't have the permission to do this. If you want to be an innovative leader, then be ready. Uh, there's going to be resistance. Well, to be a transformational leader, we need, to be we need to be passionate, but we also need to be competent. We need to be good at what we're called to do. As a father, as a mother, how can we be the best father or the best mother for our children? As a leader of an organization, uh, how, can, how can we lead in, in the most effective and efficient way that will bring about positive results? We must be competent. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 2.15, Be diligent to present yourself as approved to God as a workman that does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately uh, the word of truth. Competence is a requirement for transformation leaders if we're, if we're going to be able to lead with excellence. Emotion and a passion alone won't bring about systemic changes. A person may be given a title, but trust and respect must be earned. Martin Luther King is one that I mentioned who was a great leader here in, in our country, in the United States of America. When he saw the tragic situation of segregation, where people were treated differently because of the color of their skin, he learned as a young boy, when he was only seven or eight years old, his best friend, Martin Luther King, was black, and, and his best friend was white. And they were very close until his friend's parents said, you two can no longer associate with each other because of the differences of your skin. Well, King's immediate response to that was anger. He began to hate all of those people who were part of that system, and, and, and it was becoming bitter about uh, the, the travesty that was taking place in, in our country. Even as he got older, that was reinforced when there were some places uh, the white children could go, like a swimming pool, but the black children were not allowed. Or some restaurants where the whites could go and eat, but the black people weren't allowed. Even on sports teams. Uh, they could travel into a city, and, and the team would eat in a restaurant, except for the black students on the team would have to go and eat in another place. Well, it was wrong. It was wrong. So Martin Luther King Jr. wanted to equip himself to the very best of his ability in order that he might lead effectively. He got a bachelor's degree in, in sociology from Morehouse College. Then he did a Bachelor of Divinity from uh, Crozier Sem Seminary. He studied some of the greatest philosophers of all time, like Plato and Aristotle, Rousseau, Hobbes, and Mill and Locke. He continued by earning a doctorate in systematic theology from Boston University. He even studied those with whom he did not agree, like Karl Marx and Lenin. He began to see why their, their philosophies of leadership and, and economics was, was flawed and beset with all kinds of problems. He also learned from some that he had great respect for, like 
like Gandhi, who led a peaceful revolution uh, among his countrymen in India uh, to remove some of the stigmas of, of the caste system. One of the most formative writings that helped Martin Luther King Jr. to shape his worldview was the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached. In the New Testament, that's found in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. This message that Jesus preached was a message of love, not hate, charity, not greed, forgiveness, not animosity. As Martin Luther King began to study the Sermon on the Mount, he began to see that Jesus was the kind of leader that he wanted to follow, but Jesus was also the kind of leader that he wanted to emulate. Now, in, in Kuzis and Posner's work, they identified that there are five best practices that every organization or every institution should really focus on if they hope to be successful in their quest. Uh, the first one of these is, is to model the way. How can we lead people where we ourselves have never been? Uh, a second one is how to inspire a shared vision. Not how do you implement your own vision, but how do you inspire, inspire a shared vision, getting the group to go along with you? The third is how to challenge the process. If we keep doing what we have always done, then we'll keep getting the same results. So if we're not being successful in our organization or successful in our quest for, for righteous laws, then why are we not? How do we challenge the process? Perhaps new laws or new leadership is needed, are needed. A fourth is to enable others to act. William Wilberforce didn't act alone to abolish slavery. He had a wonderful team called the Clapham Circle. Uh, th there's no way that Martin Luther King Jr. could have overturned these these rigorous laws of segregation, the Jim Crow laws in America, there were others that were raised up who, who traveled this journey with him, enable others to act. And the fifth one is encourage the heart. Change is, is difficult. Fighting against injustice is taxing. It wears us down. We need to be encouraged. How can we find those who will encourage us and how can we become encouragers for others? These five best practices. Well, the, the first of these practices is model the way. That's character. Uh, clarifying the priorities that you value. Again, the Apostle Paul wrote, he was writing to Timothy. This was a man that, a young man that Paul had reached out to. Paul was teaching Timothy everything that he knew so that Timothy would teach other people what he knew so that they might be teachers of still others. So that's four generations. Paul said, the things which you've learned from me, Timothy, that's two generations, entrust to faithful men, the third generation, who will in turn train others as well. A model the way. Credibility is the foundation for leadership. Uh, in Kuznets and Posner, uh, the first law of leadership is if you don't believe the messenger, then you will not believe the message. The Kuznets and Posner's second law of leadership is do what you say you'll do. If we're going to have credibility, we need integrity and honesty. Now, the people who model the way, there, there are several ways to describe those who model the way. One is they practice what they preach. Are they, they walk the talk. They do what they say. Their actions are consistent with their words. If, if they're saying that we should be loving and compassionate, and yet we're harsh and judgmental, our actions will overshadow our comments. A competent leader or transformational leader uh, will follow through on their promises. When they give their word, they mean it. And also, the competent transformational leaders will do what they say that they will do. Now, there are all kinds of values, and I would encourage you and your organization or, or your church or your community uh, to, to write down, uh, accumulate a list 
of values like beauty or competence or courage or dependability or diversity or effectiveness. Uh, just come up with your own list, your own list of, 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 of ideas or values, and then go through that list and try to clarify what are your main values? What are your non-negotiable values? What are the things that are part of who you are, your DNA, things that, that will not change? When uh, transformational leaders clarify their values, they're very clear with themselves and with others. These are the things that they value. Let me ask you a question. What are your non-negotiable values? Uh, another question is, what, what brings you sorrow or offers you joy? A uh, third question is, what are you passionate about? How can we lead others to clarify their values if we are unclear in our own values? Now, the kind of person that, that people want to follow, uh, who, who are they and what are their traits? Again, Kuzas and Pazza did research around the world. Uh, they ask, they gave lists of values, and, and they asked people to rank what their primary values were. Now, again, crossing continents and, and, and nations and, and uh, ethnicities, there were four values that dramatically stood out above all the others. If you're hiring someone in an organization, or you're leading someone on a team, or you're choosing someone for leadership, it's very important that you know what these four are. The first one is honesty. Is this person honest? The second one is forward looking. Not someone who's just living in the past, but someone who's always looking ahead. What are the opportunities and what are the challenges that, face, that we face? The third one is inspirational or inspiring. You want a leader who can stir you up. We want a, you want a leader who can tell the army to charge even into the face of the enemy. So, so these important values are honesty, forward-looking, uh, inspirational, and then there's that fourth one that we've been talking about, and that's competent. They want to follow people who know what they know, and they continue to be learners. Now, in Jim Collins' book, he tried to discern what made some, country, some companies that were good companies become great companies, and he came up with what he called five uh, steps or five different leaders. And, and the most important of these, he just called them the executive five leaders. Uh, they were the ones who, through enduring greatness, through a, a paradoxical blend of a personal humility and professional will, uh, they led their companies. They were the kind of leaders that, that looked out the window to attribute the success to other people, while they looked in the mirror to take responsibility for the things that didn't go well. They're the ones who set up their successors to succeed, not to fail. They displayed uh, a compelling modesty about themselves, even though they were, they were brave about their, their organization. These kind of leaders never wanted to be larger than life heroes. They channeled their ego needs away from themselves and into a larger goal of building great institutions. The power of vision, I want us to envision the future by imagining exciting and ennobling possibilities. Now I ask you, what is it that keeps you awake at night? What is that injustice that imperils many of the people in, in your sphere of influence? What is it that you want to do about it? Can you imagine a day when that injustice has been overturned with righteousness? William Wilberforce waited decades for slavery to be abolished, but he never stopped. He continued to channel, channel his energies to build a team, to work forward to that day when, again, uh, slavery would be outlawed. May God bless us as we continue this journey 
of trying to be transformational leaders. God bless you.